May 21st, 2024, after a morning of heavy rainfall, skies were clearing over Iowa. We knew it was probably going to be a serious day. Conditions were absolutely right for it. Meteorologists and storm chasers were monitoring the radar, preparing for an active day of severe weather. By the afternoon, a line of storms developed along a cold front, and it was moving fast. And we were kind of riding along with the line. A group of researchers with mobile radars and instrument pods was in chase mode, on a mission to gather data. It was completely rain-wrapped. I mean, all we could see was just pouring rain. Today, we're going off the radar as one of those researchers recounts the day this team intercepted the Greenfield, Iowa tornado. There was just no way to stay with it because of the way it was moving. She'll share the terrifying moments of deploying a pod, then narrowly escaping the tornado that leveled the town. As we were deploying, we had debris falling all around us. And so I remember looking at our own radar scope and thinking, I don't think we have time for this. Like, I don't actually think we're going to make it. And dealing with the emotional weight of surveying the damage afterward. So I kept myself on the east side of town, knowing that it would get progressively worse as we drove into town. Nothing can change the fact that now we know that people were dying while we were deploying. We'll learn about the groundbreaking data the team recorded that day and how it could revolutionize our understanding of these deadly storms. At a very fundamental level, we don't really know how strong the winds are and what the winds are like in tornadoes very near the ground. So instead of waiting for it to come to us, we go to the weather. I'm meteorologist Emily Gracie, and you're listening to Off the Radar, a production of the National Weather Desk. On the show, we dig deep into topics about weather, climate, the ocean, space, and much more. Our goal is to help you better understand the weather and to love it as much as we do. Hi, everyone. Happy August. Welcome to Off the Radar. I'm your host, Emily Gracie. Thanks to all our new listeners to the show, if you aren't already following, make sure you hit that follow button wherever you get your podcast so you're alerted of new episodes that publish every Tuesday morning. Today's episode is all about the deadly EF4 tornado that tore through Greenfield, Iowa on May 21st of this year. A team called Dow or Doppler on Wheels was able to get close enough to this particular tornado to detect temporary wind speeds over 300 miles per hour on their radar. That's some of the highest wind speeds ever recorded in a tornado. So today I'm talking to three of the people that were on this mission. Jen Walton is a storm chaser and the founder of an organization called Girls Who Chase. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time she was telling the story of intercepting this tornado and how she balanced her job with her personal safety and emotional well-being during the whole ordeal. Then I'll be talking to two scientists that head up Doppler on Wheels, Dr. Karen Kosaba and Dr. Josh Werman. They'll talk about why this data is so important to understanding how tornadoes work, how they form. They'll also talk about how the DAOs are being used to improve forecasting other types of major weather. This isn't Twister, folks. This is real-life research that it's based on, though. And it's very interesting and very helpful to the future of forecasting. Let's start by hearing about the day of the Greenfield tornado from Jen Walton. I have a very special guest with me today, my friend Jen Walton, storm chaser, science communicator, founder of Girls Who Chase. Jen, thrilled to have you on the show today. First things first, have you seen the movie Twisters? Oh my gosh. Well, thanks for having me on. Again, it's great to talk to you. Um, I have seen the movie Twisters. I have now seen it twice. um, And I'm gearing up for definitely a third time because I feel like every time I see it, I notice different things. And the first time I was very focused on kind of the overall plot, I think, you know, you're kind of taking it all in. The second time I was really looking for the like Easter eggs, you know, the, the Twister, the Twister gems and trying to see if I could see some of my friends who, you know, were extras in the movie and some of their vehicles. So um, this time around, I'll have to choose a new focus area. Um, I'm going to see it as many times as I can while it's on the big screen. So you liked it. I did like it. I have to say, uh, I think they all kind of set us up a little bit with the trailer to appear as though it was going to kind of follow this old tired storyline. And then it really didn't. And 
I one of the things I appreciated the most was how they mixed up the stereotypes of storm chasers in the movie. There was a lot of diversity. People were changing roles throughout um, and kind of their personalities were shifting as they were growing into their kind of various areas of expertise. And so it was just really cool to see it mixed up. And of course, um, from the Girls Who Chase perspective, I think our female lead character, um, at least my hope, of course, is that there are a lot of little girls watching this movie and thinking, man, oh man, she is cool and I want to be her when I grow up. So yeah, they really stepped it up with the female lead. I mean, Twister, the original, great, all good, but like this is kicked up way a notch. So um, very cool. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. I also am curious because part of the plot line, and I don't think this is a spoiler alert in any way, but part of the plot line is like plopping down radars around a tornado. And that's really what today's podcast episode is about. So I'm curious. Accuracy wise, can you tell me anything how that what you saw in the movie with that plot line compares to like Doppler on wheels and what you did over the past several months? Sure. And so funny enough, the second time I saw Twisters, we actually had a Dow. It was a Colorado storm chaser event, Colorado weather event. We had a Dow come and join us. So Josh Warman and Karen Kasiba were sitting next to me for the movie. And so I got to also enjoy their reaction. <laughs> to some of that, as well as my own. And um, in short, you know, there was like a lot of muttering going on during the (laughs) radar deployment. I'm sure. Um, And honestly, even even the first time I saw it, uh, when they weren't sitting next to me, my first thought was, oh my God, that thing is going to go flying. Like the minute you get a good wind gust, there is just no way, right? Um, And I, I love the idea of getting this kind of 3D image of radar. And, and I think if I, I learned a ton from being part of the Dow team this year. Um, It just was, it's something I've always wanted to do is get out in the field and contribute to tornado research. And in a lot of ways, I was kind of like living the dream. And so I would just say, you know, never give up on a dream. But um, one of the things I learned is how close you actually have to get to tornadoes to really get the kind of high res detail data that they're looking for to be able to produce research and and learn and kind of progress the field. So there were certainly some shaky moments, I think, both for us in the scout vehicle when I was deploying pods, but I also had the opportunity to ride in the Dows a few times during deployments as a navigator. Um, and those things got pretty close. <laughs> I want to back up and tell people kind of your involvement in this project, too. And, you know, for those who don't know, you keep saying Dow, but like Doppler on wheels, yeah. not everybody yeah. has the, the acronyms in our fun world. Um, so tell me about how you got involved in that project. And, you know, were you riding along? Were you doing the work with them? What was your involvement? Sure. I mean, the short version of the story is I met Josh and Karen just through being part of the weather community um, and frankly, the science community for a long time. Everybody is kind of one degree removed from each other. And um, it turns out that there aren't a ton of storm chasers with storm chasing background and and experience who get pulled into this type of work. And um, I'm actually kind of working on that a little bit because we do have a lot to contribute both in terms of especially veteran chasers, right? Who've been doing this a long time. They've been watching weather patterns change over time, but also, you know, we know storm structure. We know how to identify behavior, storm behavior, right? There's a lot we can kind of contribute in terms of if you're trying to deploy sensors in the field or find other ways to gather data. So um, it really was just a short conversation with Karen um, who kind of offhand was like, how do you feel about swarm songs? <laughs> and I was like, well, um, if it means I get to get close to tornadoes and help out with research, sign me up. You know, I am in. So um, they are currently operating on what's called the NSF BEST project, which is um, an NSF funded project that is studying kind of the ground level behavior of tornadoes. So there's a lot we're able to see kind of in the midsection and upper levels of storms, but it really is dependent on how close you are to a radar 
Um, and so what the mobile radars are able to do, and that's really what the Doppler on wheels is, is a radar on wheels that you can transport close to an event um, and be kind of nimble and responsive to it, is fill in those gaps that radars are not able to obtain on their own. Um, and then, of course, they're also trying to deploy a variety of different types of sensors um, as uh, either on in a pod, um, which is basically a, a heavy metal object with sensors affixed to it that we place ideally in the path of oncoming tornadoes, um, or sensors that are affixed to balloons that get launched into the inflow of a storm. So a lot of different ways to build a 3D picture of tornado behavior, whether it's wind speed or pressure or um you know, something similar that helps you understand, for example, is a tornado actually moving faster at the ground than it is in the mid levels? Um, and how does that impact um, con building construction? What do we, how do we need to build differently to make sure people stay safer that buildings are able to withstand, you know, violent tornado behavior, for example? So um, May 21st was a tragic day, also a big day for scientific research. Can you give me a brief overview of what happened that day and what your experience was like personally? Yeah, May 21st, 2024 is probably going to be one of those events that is going to stick with me for life. It was a first for me in a lot of instances, uh, first pod deployment in front of an oncoming tornado, my first time in Iowa, <laughs> randomly, um, and really my first time being in close proximity to what we now know was a violent tornado and uh, one of the fastest, you know, had some of the fastest wind speeds on record. We knew it was probably going to be a serious day. Conditions were absolutely right for it. The other concern is that storm motions were uh, kind of pronged to be quite rapid. So 45 plus miles an hour, which makes it pretty difficult to deploy a team with multiple vehicles and different types of sensors. I mean, you really have to move quick for that. The way the day ended up evolving, we ended up kind of more in chase mode, um, trying to stay ahead of it. And for a while, there were no tornadoes. It was actually kind of a fast moving um, QLCS kind of line with embedded rotating storms in it. And we were kind of riding along with the line. And then at some point, the, what became the Greenfield tornado came down um, and stayed down. Um, we were kind of jogging north, northeast of it and, uh, you know, trying to find a place that looked like a good intercept location and ended up on Highway 92, which runs through Greenfield. And at that point, um, it was moving at about 45 miles an hour. It was completely rain wrapped. I mean, all we could see was just pouring rain. Um, and we didn't know it at the time, but, you know, chasers had been following it and essentially lost it because it was moving so quickly and rain wrapped. Folks couldn't see it or there was just no way to stay with it because of the way it was moving. We deployed the first Dow, Dow 6 on the west side of Greenfield, about seven or six or seven miles out of town. And I just remember in the group text, they were talking about um, the data that was coming in. And then I saw um, one of them say, we have debris falling at our location. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, you kind of have that moment where you're like, this is big and I need to be really careful with my own thoughts and um, what I, what, what I can't unsee in the very near future. Like this is going to be a big event. And then we actually drove through Greenfield um, moments before it was impacted. Dowie deployed on the east side of Greenfield, and I was in the scout vehicle with two other team members. Um, and the scout vehicle carries the pots that are designed to be deployed in the path of the tornado. And so we pulled in in front of Dowie and kind of awaited further instruction. And almost immediately, Josh turned us around and sent us back toward town and said, deploy pods in town. And at that point, the tornado was just south of town and turning. And so I remember looking at our own radar scope and thinking, I don't think we have time for this. Like, I don't actually think we're going to make it. So we turned Scout around and drove not terribly rapidly <laughs> back toward town. Myself and Scott Steiger, um, who was in there with me, got out and deployed the pod very quickly um, because at that point, 
we were seeing rapid left to right rotation in the rain bands um, on both sides of us. So that was kind of a sign that we were well inside the bear's cage, which is chaser slang for the rotating part of a storm that could be tornado producing. As we were deploying, we had debris falling all around us. It, and it wasn't pieces of tree or bushes. It was insulation and um, small pieces of wood. And we knew we had very little time, essentially. Um, at that point, as we were getting back in the truck, both of us looked up and saw sunlight. I guess you would think would be a good thing under normal circumstances, but really scared us because um, that is that was a sign that we were essentially looking up into the cut, the rear flight downdraft cut around the tornado and that we were very close. As we were making our depart out of town, the tornado was entering town um, and it was a very narrow um, kind of drill bit of a, of a tornado. It was actually quite small. And so we were less than a half mile from the center of the tornado. So if the tornado had been wider than that, we certainly would have been in the outer circulation. Um, and eventually the circulation passed north of town and we all turned around and went back toward town. I was kind of wandering around looking at things and happened to walk around the right side of the building and in the backyard was just complete devastation. Trees stripped. There was a slab that had had a building there that was no longer there. That was certainly my first time uh, seeing that significant level of damage. I think, you know, everybody processes this kind of stuff differently. I think for me, knowing I was there because I was doing the kind of research that hopefully will make a difference in the future for how we understand how to keep people safer. Softened isn't really the right word, but it's made it a little bit easier to swallow. Um, but it nothing can change the fact that now we know that people were dying while we were deploying on that event. I mean, it just <laughs> you just have to sit with that. We now know that the, this tornado um, was one of the fastest on record up there with kind of our top two, El Reno and um, Bridge Creek. You know, you're a journalist of sorts. You, you're a photographer. You're a storm chaser. How did you balance that? Were you shooting the damage as you were driving through town and leaving town? Or were you kind of overcome with not being able to handle that portion of your job at that time? I took some photos. I took a lot of photos when we were on the east side of town. As I've been kind of processing through witnessing this event, um, I've kind of forced myself to look through them because um, if we've learned anything from past events, if you don't process through this, it's going to come back and bite you um, in a way maybe that you don't want it to. So I think it's important to kind of push, move all that emotion through associated with something like this, but that's all they'll be used for. Jen, I want to hear from you on Girls Who Chase because we both know that this Twisters movie is going to create a slew of people interested in storm chasing and weather. So, and, you know, I've been talking to other people about this. You don't have to be a high schooler getting ready to pick a college major to get into weather. You can become a storm chaser as an adult, right? And Girls Who Chase has some training. Tell me about what's coming up. Yeah. It is absolutely possible to learn all of the fundamentals that you would need to learn to successfully and safely storm chase without a meteorology degree. I am certainly encouraging anyone who wants to go into meteorology to do that. And um, we have lots of folks who share their kind of path to meteorology. But I learned as an adult that I can teach myself how to storm chase. The process I went through of identifying and pulling together the educational resources I used uh, turned into what is now called spring training, which is entirely pun intended. Um, it will be March 1st, 2025. Typical topics that we cover in these trainings are um, anywhere from kind of storm structure identification to chase strategy and positioning to forecasting 101, um, understanding resources like how to use radar and satellite. And then we'll put it all together typically in a chase case study that outlines an, an actual event that happens and the process you can kind of go through to forecast and then what you might be looking at the day of an event, right? Um, in real time, what kinds of data would you be using in order to target? I know that this kind of stuff can be intimidating getting into 
weather and storm chasing feels intimidating. And this training is for every level. So if you are brand new to this and you don't know anything or even you don't know what you don't know, <laughs> um, this is a great place to start. And we will also serve all the way up to veteran storm chasers. We had a whole bunch of 20 plus year veterans on with us for spring trading 2024. All of the info and as we add speakers and the schedule and all that type of stuff will be at girlswhochase.com slash spring training. So it is entirely virtual and it is actually quite affordable because uh, we feel pretty strongly about making sure this kind of stuff is accessible to everyone and Girls Who Chase is global. So we want to make sure people from all over the world can access it. Jen Walton, thank you so much for your time today and for your work on this particular project and Girls Who Chase in general. Can't wait to see you for spring training next March. Yeah, man. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Next up, let's hear from Dr. Karen Kosaba and Dr. Josh Horman about Doppler on Wheels. All right, Josh and Karen, uh, thanks so much for joining me to talk about this project and some of the new research that's come out of it. I want to start, if you can take me back to kind of where this research project began. Right. So this mission was part of um, a NSF-funded project called BEST, um, Boundary Layer Evolution and Structure in Tornadoes. And part of this project, uh, we have multiple objectives that we're going out there and trying to collect data to address. Um, one of those is what are the winds like in the lowest levels of the tornado um, and how do they vary as a function of tornado intensity and tornado structure uh, and how do they do damage? Um, the other objective of this is looking at the surrounding thermodynamics, the um, the moisture, the temperature, and how that affects um, tornado intensity. Um, so looking at different quantities like that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to go out there with our mobile Doppler on wheels radars, um, also surface instrumentation, uh, these pods, these weather stations that we're trying to drop in front of the tornado. Um, those measure wind speed and direction, but also um, pressure, temperature, and relative humidity. Um, and then we have a, a van full of swarm balloons. Um, so just like regular you know, balloons that you do through the atmosphere, um, they're sort of like that, but they don't go up. They actually drift with the flow. Um, so we're trying to get those into the tornado as well in order to map out these thermodynamic quantities. Um, I'm sure that people have brought this up before, the <laughs> comparisons to Twister, um, because when you describe it, that's exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like you're dropping this thing in front of a tornado, just like they did in Twister uh, 30 years ago or whatever. So has this been done before? Has this been tried before? Well, we've been observing tornadoes for 30 years now with the mobile radars. Um, and we learned a lot about the tornadoes um, and we understand their structure. We understand what the wind speeds are in those tornadoes much better than we used to. But there are still some important details and some important parts of the evolution of tornadoes and also how the tornadoes do damage that we don't understand that well. Uh, we don't really understand why some tornadoes are stronger than others. We don't know why some tornadoes last 20 or 30 miles and some only go for a mile. Uh, we don't understand why some tornadoes are very small and some are very big. Well, those are critical questions if you're going to understand how much damage they're going to do. Um, perhaps if there's different types of warnings that one could give um, for very strong tornadoes versus weaker tornadoes. Um, so there's very important things about tornado evolution we don't understand. At a very fundamental level, we don't really know how strong the winds are and what the winds are like in tornadoes very near the ground. We know they're bad. They're destroying homes. But what's worse, two or 300 miles an hour for five seconds or 150 miles an hour for 30 seconds or a minute? Well, different tornadoes make different kinds of bad winds. And we're trying to understand better the different types of bad and whether there's possible ways to engineer or protect against those. So you mentioned 30 years. Has the tornado warning system made huge leaps and bounds in 30 years? And then what does the next 30 years look like given the research that's going on now? The prediction of whether or not tornadoes are going to occur on a certain day um, and maybe a few hours warning has gotten better. The computer models are much better than they used to be 20, 30 years ago. We are able to distinguish more about which storms are going to make tornadoes and which ones aren't. Um, but there's a long way to go. Uh, the progress has been, it's, it's been forward, but it's been, it's been pretty slow. So what we're hoping in the next 30 years is that we can build on the knowledge that we've been gathering 
um, and really improve the warnings, uh, make them so that computer models could make a forecast perhaps an hour ahead of time. Um, but I think what the end goal, the finish line would be to have warnings that are more sophisticated than just yes, no, yes, there's a tornado, no, there's no tornado, um, and have warnings that are probabilistic. There's more certainty that there's a tornado or warnings that say that this is really a large tornado or a strong tornado. And there might be different actions you can take, just like people take different actions for different intensities of hurricanes. So that would be a really good place to get to. And we're not really near there yet. We're not going to get there next year. I think it's going to take years of studies like Karen and mine uh, to gain the knowledge um, to understand the tornadoes better. And then for that knowledge to then be turned into operations, into operational meteorology, making the forecast better. Can you take me through what happened on May 21st? This particular day looked like it was the forecast was pretty favorable for strong tornadoes or for tornadoes in the Iowa region. Um, so we actually had started out pretty far west and um, we were in western Nebraska. Um, so we had to drive pretty far to get there. Um, but we got there. Um, we knew the storms were going to be very fast that day. Storm motions were, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, so those are difficult storms for us to do our science with um, because we're trying to place instruments in the path of the tornado. We're trying to get our radars very close to the tornado. Um, so it's difficult to do that when the storms are moving quickly. Um, so we discussed lots of different strategies on how to do this. Um, one of our things is we we're just going to plant our instruments and let the storms keep coming to us. Um, but uh, in this case, we ended up chasing around and eventually um, got on the um, cell that made the Greenfield tornado. So you got an instrument pack in the path of a tornado and were successful in getting measurements? Comparisons are made sometimes between what we do and movies, such as these these Twister movies. And we grimace, but there are some similarities. The movies are about scientists who are trying to get observations in tornadoes. They throw in a lot of Hollywood drama, but the goals are kind of the same. Um, we're basically chasing after or chasing to stay in front of these tornadoes. So on the day the tornado hit Greenfield, there were very, very fast moving storms, very challenging for us to do our mission. Um, but we managed to get radars. We had two radars, two of the Doppler wheels deployed, uh, one west of Greenfield, probably about 10 miles, surveying the whole storm and seeing the larger scale evolution. And then Karen and I went forward with part of our team to deploy one of our radars very close to Greenfield uh, to get very fine scale resolution data in that tornado. And we managed to deploy one of these ruggedized pods um, kind of at the edge of the tornado. Okay. And then how do you keep it from blowing away? Well, the pods are heavy. Um, they're very bottom weighted. Um, so in general, they're probably not going to blow away. They're going to tip over if anything. Um, and you know, unless they're usually hit by debris or something like that, um, they'll probably say operational um, through the tornado passage. The measurements of the calculation of 300 mile an hour winds in this tornado was from the radar data, not so much from the pod data. The pod was in a much weaker part of the tornado. The winds were probably 70 or 100 around that tor uh, where the pod was. There was minor F1 level damage near that pod. With the radar, we map out everywhere. So we see what the winds were over the pod. We see what the winds were east of town, west of town, and we see what the winds were in that very narrow swath. And that's where we determine these wind speeds of just over 300 miles an hour. Is Doppler on wheels used for other types of weather other than tornadoes? Yes. I mean, the Doppler on wheels have been used to study all sorts of different types of weather. Um, blizzards, lake effects, snow, alpine weather, flooding, um, you name it. Anything you sort of want to get up close to and look at in great detail and look at close to the ground, um, mobile radars are great for doing that. What we do with the Doppler on wheels and also our pods, our mesonets, our weather balloons is targeted weather observations. So for any type of weather, instead of waiting for it to come to us, we go to the weather. So now we're in standby for hurricane season. And if hurricanes are threatening the coast of the U.S., we will drive our fleet of radars and mesonets and balloons, whatever we can muster, to the coast to be there ahead of the hurricane. So we target that hurricane. By getting up close, we're getting thousands of times finer scale detail. It's like you have a microscope as opposed to a, a picture across a parking lot of what the winds are, what the small scale details are inside those events. Uh, and during fire season, we'll drive the radars and other instruments near to where the fires are so we can map out what's happening in those fire plumes. 
uh, different kinds of alpine weather and snowstorms. We go to other countries sometimes to do studies of different types of weather, targeted studies from close up. I know that some things can be picked up on radar that aren't weather related too. Um, do you ever see stuff that you didn't expect when you're, <laughs> when you're using them? The UFOs are what scare us the most. No. <laughs> um, we see we see insects, um, and very importantly, we see insects, and uh, we can watch them evolve. And we basically use those to to measure the wind because a lot of very small insects are kind of being carried by the wind. Uh, we do see birds, bats. Occasionally, we'll see aircraft. So anything that the energy bounces off of returns to us. Since we're trying to see the winds, those things which are moving different than the wind, like a train or a car or a bird, uh, we treat it as contamination to our data. We basically have to try to filter that out uh, so that we can get what we're looking for, which is what the wind speeds are. In a tornado, we're measuring the movement of raindrops in the outer part of the tornado, but the movement of debris as you get closer to a very strong tornado like Greenfield. And that's a complicating factor because the debris is probably moving slightly slower than the winds in a strong tornado like Greenfield. So there are some factors that make our wind speed estimates underestimates of how strong the, the winds are. But that's all we can measure. We do what we can. When you're out on location doing this, what is the atmosphere, not the actual atmosphere, the atmosphere of the crew like? Is it is it high intensity? Is it um, is it stressful? Is it dangerous at all what you're doing? We have a very specific scientific mission that we're doing, and we're doing a very complex choreography of where to put our instruments, where to put our pods. And so during a tornado, even during something as dramatic as a very strong tornado, we tend to be just very focused. Um, we are the opposite of what you probably see on TV, either in movies or chasers screaming about the tornado. We're just giving instructions to different members of our teams. Please move one kilometer down the road or please deploy the pods here and here and here or Dow six. You have another minute and then you have to move because the tornado is coming your way or it's moving away from you. So we tend to be very focused, very determined in what we're doing not going crazy um, like you might see either on TV or perhaps people who are doing this recreationally. Yeah, I mean, sometimes things are moving really fast. I mean, for the Greenfield tornado, things move really fast in that situation. Um, there's not much time to do anything other than plot the location and make sure we're in the right place and other people are in the right place. Um, sometimes when tornadoes are nice and slow moving, <laughs> um, you know, Duke tornado, even though one of our teams had gotten stuck in the mud, um, it's you know, there's a lot more time. You could actually, you know, get out of the radar and take a look at the tornado um, and, you know, see what's going on um, and things move a little bit slower. Um, so it sort of depends on the storm motion and what's going on um, at the time. Cool stuff. What's next for you guys? What's the, wh where are you going next? Hurricane research. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever pops up. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of unanswered questions about landfalling hurricanes and especially at the surface because they're challenging to observe. But obviously that's when it starts impacting people, not when it's, you know, off the coast. Um, so as it's making landfall, a lot of things are changing in the boundary layer. Um, models have a hard time capturing what's going on in the boundary layer. Um, so they're not getting all these processes. They're parameterized. Um, so they're you know, assigning values to these processes. Um, so some of the things that we're trying to do is really understand, you know, like Josh mentioned, mixing through the boundary layer, mixing winds up and down, um, mixing energy through the boundary layer. And how does that affect intensity? Um, also, with the observations that we've been getting with the Doppler on wheels, we see a lot of different structures in the hurricane boundary layer. Um, so everybody now knows these streaks that you see in the hurricane boundary layer. It's these linear features that have, you know, stronger winds periodically. Um, and they're in every hurricane. Uh, but there's other structures. There's tornado scale vortices, so small little vortices that are tornado scale, um, but have strong winds in them and could cause localized damage. Um, there's also meso vortices, those big vortices you see rotating around the eye wall um, that can enhance the winds. Um, at the surface too. So we're trying to get a handle on all these different structures in the boundary layer and how they affect the winds and how they affect the energetics. There are things going on in hurricanes and landfalling hurricanes that no one knew were there until we started looking with the dows. So the first time we took a dow into a hurricane, we observed something that was completely unexpected. We thought it was a malfunction for a while, but it was right. These helical rotations, um, which were making streaks in the radar data and mixing energy and mixing strong winds down to the surface. We've also seen in some hurricanes, not all, 
um, these very small tornado sized vortices that are in the eye wall um, and probably are associated with much worse damage because the winds are very enhanced there. They're already bad in the eye wall, but there's these little vortices, these tornado scale vortices that are worse. And we've only seen those because we've taken the radars in there and, and mapped them out. So there are still unknowns in this very violent and difficult to observe environment inside landfalling hurricanes. Wow. Yeah, you always hear so much research going into, you know, what's going on when they're out at sea. And I never hear about it, them being studied making landfall. So that's super cool. Do you travel for like just big ones or do you like if there's a little cat one or a tropical storm making landfall somewhere, will you study that one too? For scientific purposes, we would love to be able to study every single one. But it is too just too difficult to do that, both for time and our instruments and uh, money. Really, it costs a lot of money to take a big team of people all the way to the coast and back. So we tend to target the stronger hurricanes, um, the ones that have the potential to have worse, stronger impacts. Um, we tend to study hurricanes that might be making landfall in a place that's easier for us to do our mission. Um, to get our radars right up to the coast. There are some parts of the coastline that were very swampy and hard to operate in. Uh, the west coast of Florida, um, Louisiana are very difficult. Um, so we prefer to study hurricanes in places where we can collect better data. Yeah. So just like tornadoes, I mean, you don't want to just look at one tornado. Um, I mean, case studies are great. And obviously these very impactful tornadoes, you know, make for great studies to look at. Um, but you want to look at the whole spectrum of, you know, tornadoes or hurricanes. Um, so, you know, hurricanes in particular, um, a lot of hurricanes are dying as they're making landfall. Um, so there's, you know, weakening as they're losing sort of the ocean energetics. Um, but then there's these cases that have been happening, I feel like more recently, but maybe not, um, where you're getting rapid intensification. Um, so where the hurricanes are intensifying as they're making landfall. Um, and different things are probably going on, um, you know, in the low level wind field as opposed to the dying hurricanes. Um, so again, you do want the spectrum of them, um, but you know you want the high end, you know, mixed with the low end. So si when scientists are studying rare events, we tend to focus on individual storms. So we'll do a scientific study of the Greenfield tornado or the Greensburg tornado, um, you know, this tornado or that tornado. Um, we might do a scientific study on a particular hurricane um, that hit somewhere. But some of the biggest advances in science come from studying not just individual tornadoes, but studying them as a group. By going out year after year studying tornadoes, we are starting to get to the point where we can study tornadoes as a species, um, as, as a class of phenomena. We've observed 250 tornadoes. Um, Karen just recently led a paper where she looked at 73 different tornadoes where we had low-level measurements. So we could see as a group how strong the winds were that we were measuring compared to what we were seeing closer to the ground. And we're starting to ask other questions too. How, you know, are, are the bigger ones stronger? Um, do the bigger ones last longer? Um, what kind of size changes are happening as intensity changes are happening? We're trying to answer those questions as in a general way as opposed to just one particular tornado to really advance uh, the science. Off the Radar is a production of the National Weather Desk. Make sure you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can now find the podcast on YouTube as well. Just search the National Weather Desk and it's under the podcast tab. If you like today's episode, please share it with a friend. You should also check out other episodes about tornadoes, like the one about the movie Twisters that came out last week. We'd also love you to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Let us know what you think of the show and give me ideas for future episodes. A big thanks to Jen Walton, Josh Werman, and Karen Kosaba for their work and for joining me today. For the National Weather Desk, I'm meteorologist Emily Gracie. Make it a great day.